mm-hmm. honestly, I think we're coming to a tipping point because, I mean, at least we worked in Florida as CSIs, and I know that there are other states that pay their CSIs significantly higher than Florida. Yeah. For one of the if you get 40k in Florida, like that's yeah. doing pretty good. Florida is very very low, but we we are searching for candidates with all of these requirements and we're not compensating them for it. So we are either going to have to choose to pay to get the candidates that we're wanting or we're going to get we're going to have to accept less lower quality candidates. Hey there. My name's Ashley Church and I'm Erin West. We were once newly promoted crime scene and latent print supervisors on mutual struggle buses as we both simultaneously tried to navigate through the challenges within our forensic units. Now we run a business where we create tools and resources that we wish we had had to make these transitions easier. We like to talk about the experiences we've had in the forensic field, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in the hopes to create awareness around these issues and move the needle forward to create positive change in the forensic community. So if you're a forensic professional, regardless of your years of experience, who's not afraid to dive into real, raw, and sometimes uncomfortable topics, you're in the right place. This is the Forensics Unfiltered Podcast. Welcome. Come on in. Have a seat. This is the third episode of Taboo Topics Tuesdays. Last week we talked about being pregnant as a CSI and this week we're going to talk about money problems in the forensic field. The first time you've ever come to our page. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm um, one of the co-owners of Gap Science and this is Erin. She's the other co-owner of Gap Science. Hey, Erin. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. Okay, so like I mentioned before, um, we're going to talk about money problems today. This is a huge topic. There's so many things to unpack. I think what we're going to talk about first is like salary in general, because it's usually really low, at least based on our experiences. And there's other topics like not getting paid to be an FTO, not getting paid for being on call, not getting paid for working odd shift hours. So it might turn into a multiple part series talking about money, but for right now, we're going to dive in first into just salary. I've only worked as a crime scene investigator and a forensic supervisor, but Erin, you have worked multiple positions at different levels of government. Yeah, I've worked for, I've worked as both a public servant, as many of us are, and I've worked as a private government contractor as well. And so, I mean, we can definitely talk about the money differences between those two worlds because they are significantly different, very, very different money between those two worlds. But I started as as a public servant working for a county agency fresh out of college. I had a bachelor's degree when I was first hired and started working as a CSI, and this was many years ago. I started in 2006, so it's almost, we're rounding the corner on 20 years here. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) when I started as a CSI, we made $12.82 an hour or something like that. So I graduated college. I quit the job that I have in college, which was working at Olive Garden, so that I could pursue my career in forensics. And then I quickly realized that I couldn't afford to pay my bills with my crime scene salary. So I went back to working at Olive Garden. So I actually worked crime scene during the day and I would drive my crime scene van to Olive Garden. I would work at Olive Garden at night and sometimes I would get called out directly from Olive Garden and go right out to a call out. And many times I made more at Olive Garden than I did at my full-time job as a CSI, <laughs> which is great. Isn't that funny? Yeah. True story. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, in almost 20 years, it hasn't really gotten much better. Yeah. <laughs> so I started out, I think, just above $16 an hour as a crime scene investigator, and that came with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely an issue. I don't think, at, at least for... 
public servant positions and crime scene investigator positions, like I know they've done pay studies. If you're new <laughs> and your agency claims like, oh, we're going to do a pay study. I've heard agencies do that for like decades. And this, the result's always the same. Like, oh, you're underpaid and then nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. I think, we're, I think honestly, I think we're coming to a tipping point because I mean, at least we worked in Florida as CSIs, and I know that there are other states that pay their CSIs significantly higher than Florida. Yeah. Florida is one of the if you get forty k in Florida, like that's yeah. doing pretty good. Florida is very very low, but we we are searching for candidates with all of these requirements, and we're not compensating them for it. So we are either going to have to choose to pay to get the candidates that we're wanting, or we're going to get we're going to have to accept less lower quality candidates because, you know, we're wanting people with hard science degrees that have bachelor's and master's degrees. We want people with certifications. We want people with experience. And uh, that's all stuff that you have to pay for. And a lot of our agencies, you know, because a lot of the forensic units are, are a very small, teeny little piece of a large agency. And so, and many of our agencies don't understand why we are so expensive. <laughs> like, <Yes. laughs> I'm constantly, like, being teased by my chain of command about how expensive my units are and how expensive forensics is. And I'm, I'm always reminding them, like, you guys want all the tools and the toys and the technology and the people, and that costs money. Otherwise, we can slap some black powder on stuff and we won't need to require a bachelor's degree for any of our people, you know? So I think we're kind of reaching that point where it's like how much, you know, how much of that stuff do we want? How much are we going to pay for it? Because people that are going and getting their bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and coming in with certifications, all of that stuff, it's going to be hard to snatch up those people for $35,000 a year, you yeah. know? And on top of that, you want to keep them, don't you? Like, you can't pay them such a shit pay. And maybe, like, they're fresh out of college. They're willing to take anything. I bet you they're going to be searching within a year or two with your, their crap salary. They're going to be searching elsewhere to see who pays more. And, and then you're going to just basically be a training agency. You're, you know, they're going to get their couple of years of experience, and then they're going to go somewhere that actually pays more. Right. So not only do you, are you have, do you have to be willing to pay them what they deserve, but you have to be willing to actually like pay above the bare minimum just yeah. to keep your employees. I also think that's the case with certifications. A lot of our agencies want certifications and they want them to obtain their certification once they come or they want to hire them in with certifications. But my certification, like I, I joke with people a lot that my my latent print certification, that piece of paper is more valuable than my degrees are. Like I can take that piece of paper and get a job anywhere and go make money anywhere with that piece of paper. So my agency, like we desire all of our people to get certified, but there's no step up when they do. So I'm fully anticipating as a supervisor over forensics that I'm going to help them get certified and then they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere that's going to compensate them for that certification. And as a supervisor, I understand that that's probably going to happen, but that's hard. That's a hard thing to know that that's coming down the pipe and, and preparing for it. And it's definitely something that I want people that are like in college or thinking about going to college for forensics, do not get sucked in to so much student debt because you're going to get paid a shit pay. <laughs> And you're going to have that debt forever. You're not going to be able to pay it off. Like, do not go out there and spend, like, tens of thousands of dollars just on a bachelor's degree. But then people do that even more and go get, you know, a, a master's degree that's not necessarily necessary to yeah. get in. Um, but it does give you a little bit of a leg up. Yeah, I mean. When I went and got my master's because I felt like I needed to to be competitive. Because everybody, everybody as their bachelor's like your bachelor's is like your new high school diploma like it's very very common so I felt like I had to get my master's to be competitive yeah. and I really 
Yeah, like I can really say I really don't do a whole lot with my master's. It probably has helped me here and there, but I, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it, but whatever. It probably has. I don't know. But yes, that was a lot of time and money investment to, you know, come out of school and not really be compensated that well. Um, did you pay out of pocket or did you get loans? Oh, I got loans. Yep, sure yeah. did. <laughs> so I was fortunate enough. I felt the same way. I'm like, okay, bachelor's clearly isn't enough. Everyone around me was getting their master's, so I felt like I needed a master's too. And I was super lucky that I actually had an assistantship. So I didn't have any debt for my bachelor's degree. I didn't have any debt for my master's degree. And again, like I really don't use my master's too much. It did teach me a lot of life lessons, but was it worth tens of thousands of dollars? I don't know. But just to like drill that home, like if you can get education for free or at a very low cost, go for it. But you know, you can always go back and get your master's at the entry level positions if you have like tuition reimbursement at your agency. And I feel like that's a much better way to go. Like maybe as with your bachelor's, maybe you're not able to get the CSI position you want, but maybe you could get a dispatch position or a records position while you're there get your master's, get tuition reimbursement, and then work your way into the crime scene unit. And I feel like that's a lot better money-wise. It may take you a little bit longer, but I feel like the financial side of things is so much better. I feel like people don't take advantage of that as much as they should. Like a lot of agencies will require you to pay back your um, tuition if you don't stay for like a certain period of time after the fact. And so people will hesitate starting their degree because they're like, oh, but then I'm stuck for two years. Well, guess what? Five years is going to go by in the blink of a freaking eye, okay? <laughs> and you're going to turn around and be like, damn, I wish I had just gone ahead and started that. Because if they could pay for some or all of your degree, I mean, I started my master's degree. I worked for the FBI TDAC lab. I started my master's degree in that laboratory they had a um, two-year buyback program or whatever. And I did have to pay back some of my tuition when I left, but they covered a lot of my school. And I, I started anyways, because I was like, oh, well, I don't know where I'm going to be in a couple of years, like whatever. I started, yes, I had to pay some of that back, but the amount that was paid was well worth it. So like if you're if your company offers some kind of program like that, take advantage of it. If you want to go back to school, just do it. Like you might finish your degree and then end up being there a year or two and it's not even an issue anymore. And you were so stressed about starting because you didn't want to be stuck there. Yeah. yeah. And on the degree topic, before we like branch off of it, that's also another reason why I, I loved my forensic program. We both did forensic degrees, but I don't necessarily like advise people to go get one, like get a biology degree, get a chemistry degree, because it doesn't like put you in a corner if you're not able to get a job or you get into the field and you don't like it. Then you just wasted all of that time and money and, you know, people become very bitter after that. And I understand, but be a little bit smarter with your, your time and your money yeah. when you're going out and getting those degrees. Same with me. I mean, I went, I got my master's in forensic DNA and serology. And what I should have done before I did it because I love DNA and I love genetics and all that stuff. And I was like, this will be interesting. You know, I can go work in a DNA lab, which I, what I didn't do was look and see how much DNA analysts make before I went and got a master's degree in it. So I had already been in the working in the field <laughs> like 10 years, went and got my master's degree started applying at DNA labs and I was like, oh my God, I have to start all over again and they get paid shit. And at this point in my career, I can't start all over again. Like I can't take a twenty, thirty thousand dollar pay cut to go all the way back to the beginning and start start again. So I was like, I'm gonna be a latent examiner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't use. I didn't I mean I have the knowledge, but I've never actively worked as a DNA analyst. Um, what I would do now is I probably would have gone to school for digital forensics because that is a hot, 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 hot field right now. So everyone in the other is hiring digital forensic people and you wanna talk about the difference between working in a public service job and working in private industry. Like private companies are hiring people to do digital forensics right now for like outrageous amounts of money 
to work from home. So <laughs> that is probably where I would have steered if I had thought to do some research before I jumped into my master's program. But I just kind of panicked and I was like, everyone's getting their degrees. I need to get a degree. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So do you want to open that topic of like salary differences between sure. like rent versus yeah. a private? Sure, sure. I mean, so I worked as a CSI, told you guys I worked at the office during the day. I worked at Olive Garden at night, soup, salad, and breadsticks. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo sauce. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I digress. This was, this was my youth. So I worked there for five years, right? Slaving away, working two jobs. And like really as a CSI, we do some pretty incredibly gross stuff. So for $12 an hour, I was digging in biohazard, like all the things. And then um, I had a girlfriend that worked for an army contract. And I didn't even know, like they didn't tell me when I went to college that as a CSI or a forensic scientist, you could work for a private uh, laboratory or the military or whatever. I didn't know those were options. I just thought you work for the city, you work for the county, you work for the state. That's it. So I had a girlfriend that had a job at this military contract and she was like, Hey, they're hiring. Do you want a job? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Whatever. You know? So they called me and I did my interview on the phone. And so they, they talked to me about salary and they were like, we're going to offer you $89,000 a year. Is that acceptable? And I was <laughs> I was silent. Like I was just mute on the phone and they were like, is that, is that not enough? Now me, I was <laughs> like three was, times the amount you made. <laughs> yes. I was very young in my career. So I could have at this point in my career, I would confidently argue my salary. But at that time I was like, Oh, that's fine. That's great. You know? So I took that position, went up and worked for the military for years, tons of military contracts. Like if you live anywhere near, Maryland, DC, Virginia, that whole area, there are tons of military forensic contract jobs in DNA, in latent prints. There's a huge laboratory in um, Atlanta, or not Atlanta, is in Georgia. There's another one there. There's um, Huntsville, Alabama. There's a huge area there. Those are all private forensic contracts. DNA, latent prints, processing, digital forensics, all of that stuff. And oh my gosh, the salaries are incredible. Right. So, um, yeah, your West, the West coast people get paid a lot more than we do. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> from Florida, I, like that's yeah, like I, died <laughs> from Florida. I was like, Oh my God, $89,000, you know, and the California people are like, I can't afford my studio with that. <laughs> my studio apartment. I don't even so, think that's a studio. I feel like that's a closet. <laughs> yeah. I'm broke. So it's all, it's all relative. For me, it was like a fortune. So I worked up there for years before I moved back down to Florida. I think my final salary was something like 118 in Virginia. And all of the latent examiners on our contract, they were, they were all in the, the six figures. Like at least they were all over like 110 or higher is what they were making up there. Now we were living in the, you know, Virginia, DC, Maryland area, which it is more expensive. But that was plenty of money to live off of and have extra, you know. And then uh, when we moved back down to Florida, that was a very significant pay cut. So, but I will tell you some of the some of the other differences that came with that. So, working at a local government agency, obviously, I get some benefits and perks like a vehicle with mileage and gas. That's really nice. I also get our benefits are a lot better, you know. So we get a really great. Um, insurance at pretty low cost. We get really good retirement. We get a lot more paid days off, like the contract that I worked for up there. I'm, I must not have read the paperwork. I just saw the 89000 and I signed on the dotted line. And then when I started, I worked 12-hour uh, shifts. And so when I started, I earned three hours a pay period. And I was like, hmm, I was like, I must have like a sick time bank or s somewhere else where I'm saving my, yeah, no, it was three total hours. So for me, I had to save up a lot. four months to get one day off. Wow. <laughs> yes. So the, the PTO was bad. The, there was no retirement. Like you had to invest in your own retirement here. And this might be a Florida thing. I don't know about other States, but here they, 
they invest in our retirement for us. You know, we had to do a 401k, the benefits were more expensive, obviously PTO was absent. But on the flip side of that, you got compensated by being paid a lot more money. So I did invest in a 401k and I did, you know, pay for my insurance and that was all fine and good because I made enough money to do that. So, so that's kind of some of the flip side of working private. Yeah. And I feel like people are attracted to government jobs. Like there's a lot of perks that go with it, but then people don't use it. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like they have medical insurance, you can have vision insurance um, and dental insurance and then I know people that have worked there for years and they're like yeah I haven't seen a dentist in a long time I'm like but why yeah <laughs> you're paying for it there were other things too I mean it, it, it was very cool experience like they would do bonuses like you know how you hear about corporations that give monetary bonuses like you could get a bonus so if you really kicked ass throughout the year they'd cut you a check for like a couple thousand dollars at Christmas time you're like well shit Okay. Not a thing yeah. for government. <laughs> hey, yeah. Um, so stuff like that was really cool. I think one of the stressful things about working in contracting and working in private industry like that is that the contracts only last for a limited amount of time. So I have a job now at a local government agency. As long as I don't fuck it up, <laughs> I'll keep that job till I'm ready to leave that job. But contracting, you could literally come in and like tomorrow they could be like, well, the contract's done. So this, this job's gone. And yeah. people were used to that. Now me, my type of personality, that doesn't stress me out at all. It doesn't bother me. I thought it was fun and exciting and you can move from contract to contract. If you are one of those people that like desperately needs stability and you're like, oh my gosh, but your pension, oh, don't let your pension go. <laughs> if you're one of those people, then contracting is not for you. <laughs> so like along the lines of pension, we were both raised that you go get a government job. It has all the benefits. Yeah. You get the retirement. Like that was drilled into my brain. And when, when I started, I don't know about you, but like the pension you can get after 30 years and now they've bumped it up to 35. So you have to work in this little retirement like system for 35 years. That's a long, long time. And I don't know if this is true. Like I haven't met with, and obviously we're talking about Florida here. I haven't met with one of our FRS retirement representatives lately, but one of my best girlfriends just met with hers and they were talking about the drop because in our retirement program, at the end of the program, you can go into this, it's called a drop. And basically your, your retirement starts cashing out and they bank it for you. So when you actually retire, you just get a huge lump sum. So she was talking to them about the drop and the, the guy was like, oh, there's probably not even going to be drop available by the time you retire. You really shouldn't even talk about it. And uh, I, when she told me, I was like, so, uh, someone said Florida is 25 since we're high risk. That was back in the day. I actually got hired the year after that changed. So it's 30 yeah. years for high risk. Yeah, I think it, I can't remember what, did that change happen in 2012? Yeah, I started in 2006 in FRS, but it has changed. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be 25. And then it amped up to 30, and now we're at 35 if you're starting out. Yeah. So um, that is one one benefit, unfortunately. That's like the goalpost is getting farther and farther away. So just something to consider, you know, all of the money problems that go with this field. What is so, high risk? That's a great question. So in Florida, under the Florida retirement system, we have – high risk employees aren't anyone that are regularly exposed to like danger, biohazard, anything like that. So our all of our officers are considered high risk employees, like as part of their jobs, they're exposed to high risk hazards. And because they are high risk, they get compensated more in their retirement. So the agency puts money into our retirement for us. And if you're high risk, you get a higher percentage of money going into your retirement. So, And you can retire earlier. So yeah. someone that mentioned because they were high risk, they got to retire at 25 years instead of 30 years. Yeah. Um, whereas a normal civilian, you would have to retire at 30 years. Yeah. Some agencies qualify their forensic people as high risk, which the, that is always a question you should ask. <laughs> is yeah. this position 
high risk or not, because at least in Florida, because there are some agencies out there that do not qualify their forensic professionals as high risk, that they're not qualified as like touching and being exposed to biohazards and stuff like that. So they're getting essentially the same retirement as like the administrative assistants and stuff, even though the forensic people are out digging in nastiness. Awesome. Brain. Yeah. And I mean, it's something that you have had to fight for, for the latent print examiner positions too. Yeah. And if the, those are not out in the field, like they're still handling nasty, gross evidence. Like some people try yeah. to lift bloody fingerprints with tape and then they send it to you. You have to go to the morgue sometimes. You have to go to the jail. It's a lot more common for forensic units to be high risk. Although we definitely know that there are some out there that are not qualified as high risk which to me is just crazy, especially if you read the definition of it. Forensics is absolutely, it, it even says like forensic personnel, but latent print units too. Yeah. Since I've started at the agency I'm at now, we have had to have that discussion with our command staff about qualifying the latent print unit for high risk multiple times. So, and justifying why we also are exposed to powder and chemical and biohazard. It's much easier to argue to keep it than it is to lose it and uh, try to fight to get it back. So if you have it, fight to keep it. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a California thing, but definitely look into it. If it's something that you should be getting, fight for it. Yeah, and cities and cities and counties and states are different too. So like, our, some of our city agencies also have the same kind of thing. They have a high risk, low risk, and the high risk, the percentage, you have like a percentage of your activities that have to be high risk activities to qualify for high risk retirement. And it'll define like what all those activities are. But for the city, the high risk is 90% of your duties. So they didn't qualify forensics as a high risk function. So the forensic personnel are just the same as all the other like administrative staff at the agency, which like really, I mean, we have secretaries in our office answering phones that have never once had to go out there and dig around and decomp or, you know, do anything even remotely like that or dig through a the garbage dump or you know supposed to MRSA <laughs> yeah wade in water where there's been a floater like you know it's it's a little different so you should check out if you have that for sure and see what category you're in so one person asked is it worth leaving your current agency to go elsewhere for higher pay couple things with this at least yeah. from my perspective is pay should never be the only reason that you leave an agency. If you're just chasing the dollar, your priorities aren't super in line. <laughs> um, at least in my perspective, because it's expensive to like transfer agencies. You may live out of the county or out of the jurisdiction and then you'll have to move and that's expensive. But the grass is not always greener just because you, you get a little bit more pay. <laughs> I think that Sometimes the grass looks greener when you've been somewhere for a while, but there is not an agency on the planet that does not have their struggles. Like every agency's got their struggles. And when you move and you're there for a little while and that newness wears off, you'll see their struggles and that'll frustrate you just like the old places struggles frustrated you. I've worked at several different places now. Every place has got their thing. <laughs> There's no like perfect place that you'll search, search out and find. So I agree with Ashley, like money is great. Making more money is wonderful, but I, I vote for choosing happiness over money. Now, if it's crazy. Like if you make $12 an hour and someone offers you $89,000 an hour, well, I'll tell you what, I'll deal with their shit problems over these shit problems. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But if you're talking about like peanuts, you should stay where you're happy. Like go where you'll be most happy for sure. I did. I actually took a little bit of a pay cut to go to a different agency yeah. um, just because they had more of what I wanted as far as like pace and a job, you know, the team environment. For me, it was, it definitely wasn't pay because I took a pay cut um, yeah. and it was my happiness over pay. But on top of that something also to consider even if you're just starting out in the field or if you're trying to move to a different agency is look to see 
where that salary tops off at because it's going to be a different number for everyone. And even if you get hired at a different, a higher salary, maybe the top off is much lower than it was at the other agencies. So what that means is you can only get so many raises. And once you reach that top off point, there's no other compensation that you get. Yeah. Take that into consideration too, when you're looking at different agencies. I think consider your benefits too. <laughs> like if you, so Ashley and I both, Ashley lived like 45 minutes away. I live about an hour away from work. We both had take home vehicles with a gas card provided and our agency provides um, the toll, the, the e-passes, you know, for the tolls. So even if we have a far way to drive, you know, all of that's taken care of and we're not putting that on our own car as opposed to driving our own car there and spending our own money on gas and our own money on tolls, you know? And this is like another side tangent, but if I was going to apply for a CSI job now, like I would want to know, and obviously this isn't just for CSIs, we're talking about, you know, all forensic practitioners, but I want to know my call schedule. <laughs> Like, how do you guys work out on call? And that even goes off on a tangent of overtime. Like, I've had people not in the field yet ask, like, is overtime regular? Like, am I going to get regular overtime? Overtime is totally random and, like, dependent on your agency. So you can't count on that as being, like, extra compensation for you either. Because sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Overtime's nice. And I was all about the overtime um, when I was younger. I was, but yeah. Nowadays, I want to go to hell home. So when people say, oh, well, I make like, you know, double my salary because of all the overtime I work, that's not attractive to me because I would rather be on a vacation somewhere. <laughs> so. Great. I was the same when I was like in my 20s. I would milk up that overtime. And now I'm like, okay, the day is done. Ready to go home. Yes. 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 Another person made a point that <laughs> they are very upset. You know, we have all these requirements like you were mentioning and higher level degrees with no compensation, a very low wage. And that is something to also, I, I think we may have hit on it, but I don't remember. Yeah. For your advanced degrees, likely you are not going to get compensated for it. We both have master's degrees and for the civilian positions, they do not pay extra for those degrees. Some agencies don't even pay extra for their civilians if you have a bachelor's degree. So also take that into consideration. Definitely something you want to ask whenever you go to apply somewhere. And I will say too, like <clears throat> I talked about, you know, that we don't really use our masters that often and we don't, but you are not being competitive with what's out there if you don't at least have your bachelor's because we have a lot of people reach out to us and like I'm earning my bachelor's degree in something random you know not related to science or whatever or like I have an AA or whatever and I think for the more coveted positions you're competing against so many people that if you aren't coming in with that kind of background you probably won't even, honestly, you probably won't even be considered. So I know we just had an agency by us post a position and they had over 200 applicants. <laughs> I mean, so they're not even, they're literally before they even speak with anyone, they're going right down the list and being like, do they have any training? What is their background? Like what's their degree and all of that stuff. So like, do you have to go super far and get your master's degree? No, you don't have to do that. But I would at least get a bachelor's in a hard science or forensic science if you're trying to get into this field, for sure. Some people offered solutions, which I thought was awesome. So yeah. you know, we don't want to just like sit here and bitch like we get paid low wages Everyone feels that pain, right? But some people like suggested not living above your means and living below your means. And that will definitely help. Uh, and that starts with your degree. Like, don't look at this shiny, fancy, like forensic degree. If it's something that you can't afford, like you can definitely get a more affordable science degree. You don't have to go to some fancy college. Most people don't really care where you went to college or what your GPA is, just as long as you tick those boxes. That's or like first two years. I mean, you can knock your first two years out at a community college, which is so much less expensive. So 
when I did my bachelor's degree, I went directly to university. I was paying like a thousand dollars a credit hour. My husband, when he did his bachelor's degree, he got his AA through the community college and we were paying it out of pocket and oh my gosh, so much more expensive. And he still, I got a degree from UCF. He got a degree from UCF. Ain't nobody know that he spent two years getting half his degree in community yeah. college and we saved a fortune on his degree. And I think like I did not have good money skills when I went into college. My family was a family that never talked about money ever, like no money problems. We don't ever discuss money, whatever. So I went to college, got a credit card, like started using money frivolously without like really comprehending that I would have to pay it back and you know, whatever. And then rolled right into a $12 an hour job, you know, with those kinds of money skills. So like our agency right now, they do a free, well, it's not free. You have to buy the program, but it's uh, Dave Ramsey's financial piece is what it's called. Yes, and, yes, yes. Yeah. It's like a hundred bucks for the, the whole thing. It's like six weeks long. But something like that, like I recently, they were starting the next session and I recommended it to all of my forensic girls because it's, it's very impactful to get your money under control. And then your, your position isn't so stressful, you know, if you really are someone who's looking around to, to make better money. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't offer that program, your agency probably offers at least some type of financial advisor, financial assistance, especially for the retirement side of things. I know for sure that they do that. But yeah, I thought that was a really great thing. And on top of that, like the agencies actually look at your credit. <laughs> they want to make sure that yeah. you're not like, you know, owing so much money, especially because in the forensic units, you're going to be handling a lot of money. So it's like a high risk security type thing. People... In desperate times, um, they do desperate things and they want to make sure that you're trustworthy enough around those lump sums of money so that you're not trying to steal it to pay off for all of this debt that you have. They definitely deep dive too. I mean, for, for local government, I mean, they're really going back through your credit history to see if you have any bankruptcies, any delinquencies. Like when we sit down on an interview board before you come in and sit down for your interview. Like we've reviewed your financial records. <laughs> like it will say in there how many delinquencies you have, how many bankruptcies you have. So money, money can be a significant factor for, for not getting a job and, and for a job being stressful if it's low paying for sure. And then some other solutions they offer definitely take advantage if your agency offers a 401k, use tuition reimbursement, like we mentioned, even if you have to climb the ladder that way, like that's yeah. so much better than getting student loans. Please don't have tens of thousands of dollars in student loans and then come into this field. You, it will be very hard. It will be an uphill battle um, trying to get those paid off. And then also, also overtime. I mean, that's kind of a given. Maybe not at some agencies, though. You know, we're getting into some weird times with money where they're like, we don't want to pay you overtime. You have to flex off. So you can't always bank on overtime. Totally, totally random. So this is a friend from California. Okay. Uh, in her experience, they said the majority of positions in their area are part-time, no benefits, and starting fifteen to twenty dollars an hour, which we know ain't gonna get you anywhere in California. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! What an exciting job to do part time, like <laughs> you know, like oh, we're gonna need you to come in because we have this really disgusting floater that we need you to come work, and then you can leave for the rest of the week. I'm like, okay, great, thanks. <laughs> so, great. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless you really need some part-time gig or you just you need to get your foot in the door. Yeah. Experience. Like, I wouldn't take that position. So, I don't know. By doing that, is your agency really getting the best qualified people? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. The, the um, key is that to get really good at something, like, you have to do it a lot to get really proficient at it. So if you're just dabbling in it here and there, it's probably not building up your skill set really well. But that is the perfect position to take if you are trying to get your foot in the door. That's the perfect position. Because yes, then you can kind of learn stuff without, like, being so overwhelmed. But that's also kind of scary. Like, if they're entry level, they haven't done this before and they're working part-time, likely with no supervision, that's kind of scary. <laughs> um, are they, you know, working their cases as best as they could? 
I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. Let us know, California people, how that works out for you. Maybe there's some some benefits to it that we're not considering because we've never done that before. And obviously the agency doesn't have to pay for benefits, so that's huge for them. Yeah. <laughs> they can bring on a bunch of people. Oh, that just infuriates me though. <laughs> like, <laughs> those positions deserve benefits. I mean, yeah. your mental well being, your health, like you're exposed to all sorts of crap, not just biohazards. Like if you're out there doing arsons, now you're getting that crap in your lungs, the black powders carcinogenic. Anyway, different yeah. <laughs> So most agencies that we come across do not compensate their field training officers for civilian positions. Civil. Yet they compensate field training officers if you are sworn. We actually have known someone that is sworn and teaches civilians and sworn people, and he will get compensated when he teaches the sworn people, but he will not get compensated when he teaches civilian people, which blows my mind. <laughs> So this is the last little tangent. We'll talk about pay. And then next week, I think we can pick back up on the differences between on-call pay, certifications, different shift hours, and et cetera. But yeah, it's definitely a sore subject of mine. I was lucky enough um, to actually get paid as a field training officer, but it's only because I was able to squeak into a state-mandated field training officer training. There was a 40 hour training and then that's when I got signed off to be compensated. There's other agencies that will basically like refuse their civilian crime scene investigators to get that training. And because they haven't had that training, they don't qualify for the pay incentive to be a field training officer. Most of these programs are several months long, up to like a year, maybe two years long. So if you're going to require someone to have that much extra duties, compensate them for it. It's not even that much. Like, I think I got an extra dollar an hour. Yeah. Someone says, so got compensated 3% all year for being an FTO, but he's sworn. So that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. I love it. Yeah. I'm very happy for you. Your poor civilians get nothing, most likely. Yeah. Nothing. Um, and we Thanks. had, you know, field training programs. Like, that. you know, we ended up filling up, like, a four- or five-year binder worth yeah. of materials and exercises and quizzes and tests. Yeah. Of our officers the other day, it was so funny. He was like, you guys give them more training to do forensics than we do to let our officers carry a gun. <laughs> It's like, it's true. Our training programs are hella long and intense, you know, but we yeah. want them to, we want them to come out with all the skills they need to do the job. So we invest a lot of time and energy into it, but yeah, it's definitely not treated the same way. I really haven't. I know there are definitely agencies out there that do uh, wonderful things for their FTOs. We have a, a um, instructor that works for an agency down here in Florida. Well, we have, I mean, we have an instructor on here right now that works for an agency in Florida that compensates their FTOs. But Rebecca is the one that I'm thinking of. And they actually, like their FTOs have to apply for the position, interview for the position. They're actually selected trainers. They're not like voluntary it and then because they are interviewed and selected for the position they also get compensated for being an fto and i want to say they even have in policy that they get additional they get like extra time off because you are spending extra time like writing dors and stuff like that so as an fto like they automatically get like extra time added to their bank their leave bank or something like that to compensate for the extra time which is really really cool i mean i think that's a that's a cool thing for an agency to do for your forensic units and on top of that and besides not being compensated they're having all of these extra duties with none of their other regular duties being taken away so they have no relief they're getting extra duties and they're not getting compensated and i just i i don't agree with it but I do think, as a side caveat, if you're going to ask for a demand FTO pay, you better have a badass training program. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if you, it can't be a job shadow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you need help with one, you come to one of our classes, but you can't go to them and ask for FTO pay if it's literally like, well, they just follow. No curriculum. Yeah. yeah. You've got to have content that you're teaching them, like a manual that you're giving them. That was one of the things that 
when I had talked to my chain of command about it, about getting our FTOs compensated, that was the first thing they asked. Well, like, do you actually have a training program that's written down? I was like, yeah, we got a whole manual with exercises and evaluations and DORs and tests and practical exercises and all the things written down in a manual ready to go. So be prepared for that if you're going to fight for that. I think it's worth fighting for. If you have good FTOs, they're putting in a lot of work and a lot of a lot of extra headache to get your people trained where they should be. So with that, I think we will conclude for the night. All right, guys, we will see you next week for another next Happy Topics. Have a great night. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for being here and listening to Forensics Unfiltered. If you liked this episode, would you do us a favor and leave a review letting us know specifically what you liked about this topic? It will only take a minute, but it will really help us plan future episodes so we can bring you more topics that you want to listen to. We'll be sure to provide any links from today's episode in our show notes on our website. Head to www.gapscience.com. Until next time, stay safe out there.